morning. Good morning to music. Good morning and welcome to Atlanta A&T University Marching Band Training. If you are here, it is because you have a fervent, unequivocal belief in teamwork. Section leaders, what is our concept? One band, one sound. One band, one sound. One band, one sound. One band, one sound. Dubious to Sam, most band with a little twist. Salty your sweet, pair it up with some little men. So go for hummus, got a feeling you love it. The savory flavors are coming together, rest when it all makes above us. Switch it again, Kirk Lins, it's a thick cheese. Roll gold, show cold, it's on the lean. Grab a handle, let's find it as you're riding the tiger. Switch, switch, you know it's clean. Pony and dreaming into a very meaning. A Germany's feeding what America's eating. But the needs of the need and leave the people uneven. And the men in the middle feel what the men at the top. I think it's sick global markets. And my tits won't even mark us. Fuck us up behind the workers. Wetzel's getting what's coming. Simple twist to the plan. At the end with the first shot. Hey everyone and welcome to another Casting Networks live stream. This week we are doing a spotlight on Atlanta so we'll be talking to an agent today and we'll have a special casting director on Thursday both based in Atlanta. Our guest today has spent 20 years in various facets of the entertainment industry working as a filmmaker, actor, writer, and director. He is currently the head of film and TV at Atlanta Models and Talent, one of Atlanta's most prestigious agencies. He has recently authored a book titled Ask an Agent, Brutally Answered Questions for Actors of All Stages. Please welcome Jason Lockhart. Thanks, Tommy. <laughs> that was great. Uh, I'm glad you liked that. Um, it's great to have you. I'm really excited to chat with you today. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about you uh, talk with you about first is you started as an actor in Los Angeles and then you transitioned into being an agent. But um, your time in LA, what was that experience like? Dreadful. Um, I give mad props to anybody who is an actor in LA trying to make sufficient income to pay their bills and have health insurance. Uh, it was really hard. I. I hated getting auditions because then I immediately had to drop everything I was doing and find a place to print sides or print them at home and highlight them and memorize lines and pick out an outfit and figure out where the heck am I going to have to drive tomorrow, you know, and what time should I leave so I can get there early enough to stare at the other 82 guys that look like me and then go in the room, mess up and drive an hour and a half back home uh, and have wasted my day and a lot of stress and energy. It was a it was a tough life, so I give a lot of yeah a lot of credit to those who enjoy that process. Yeah, the actor life is not an easy life, um, and it, and it's not for everybody. So you know it, it's um, you know some people love that experience, some people exactly. I, I enjoy that, but you knew that that was not something for you. Um, but I, I have found that that experience as an actor is really helpful once you're on the other side, once you are an agent. Um, how do you think that's helped you as an agent? Incredibly helpful. Uh, I understand the psyche quite often, um, but I also know how to tame tame the nerves and the, the self-esteem goals that I don't think a lot of people have. Um, I was constantly wanting to be told that I was great. I was constantly feeling like I wasn't. Um, and I understand that none of that matters. It doesn't matter if I'm doing great or not. It only matters if you're booking. It only matters if you're moving forward and making money at it. Um, and all of that fluff and worrying about the self-esteem kind of gets in the way of what you're really trying to do, which is have a career. Uh, it doesn't really matter like how great you looked that day or, or how great you think you did or what you felt on the inside. It only matters if you book it. And if you didn't, then it's beyond your control anyways. So let it go and move on to the next thing and enjoy your life as a human not being just an actor. Yeah, and it, it's probably helpful that you can empathize with an actor and kind of what their day-to-day -day is like and, and what they're going through and, and you know, the process that they're going through in their head as well. Absolutely, especially in the good times, more so <laughs> than the bad, especially, especially in the good. So, I get very excited when I know they get to go be in a Marvel project, you know? Yeah, no, it's awesome. So how'd you become an agent? You, you were a, an actor for so long, uh, you were writing, you were directing, and then you transitioned into that agent role. How did that happen? Um, I mean, I just, after a lifetime of having done theater and getting a degree in acting and, and filmmaking and, and putting a lot, a lot of crap together, I just realized like, well, I'm not a good enough actor. I'm not a good enough writer. I, 
apparently sucking at directing. Like I just took all these things that I sucked at and said, well, <laughs> I love the industry though. Like I don't want to give up on the industry. What can I do to make money here? And um, believe it or not, Casting Networks uh, in LA, the LA casting site had a, an industry jobs bulletin in the upper right corner. And I remember the day sitting there in my Studio City apartment and seeing like commercial assistant intern agency stuff. And I submitted uh, to a bunch and um, one of them I, I specifically said, I gave up after like three or four days of no response. So then, then I specifically just said to this new one, look, I, I don't know anything about this job, but I'm a straight A student and I was president of my fraternity. I, I work really hard and I'll bring you a pizza to the job interview if you'll see me. And she wrote back, Thursday at one, thin crust veggie from Domino's. And the rest is history. It's a, it, that was 11 years ago. Wow. So it, it's mostly thanks to Domino's for providing yeah. that thin crust. This has been paid for or sponsored by <laughs> thin crust this, veggie. That's, that's awesome. Um, so you wrote a book uh, called Ask an Agent. What made you want to write a book in the first place? You know, I've been wanting to for a really long time, um, mainly to do a lot of things like this, a lot of panels and showcases, and time always runs up, you know, <clears throat> and then people start emailing questions, or they find me on social media, and they have more questions, and a lot of the questions are the same, and we never get through everything, and it's disappointing, because I often feel like, slowly but surely, we are touching lives as agents, giving truthful answers to these questions that so many actors have. And so I started collecting them, and I was dating an actress about a year ago, and, and um, you know, obviously we were very close, and she was very grateful for just all the, the conversations that we had, you know, actress, agent, and she learned a lot, and it really helped her, and she kept saying, you got to write this stuff down, you got to tell people, you got to get on Reddit, you got to maybe write a book. I was like, yeah, yeah it's a good idea. I, I want to. And um, the first day of quarantine, I had nothing to do. Every industry had shut down. Casting had basically said... You know, nothing's shooting. Uh, so I said, I'm going to set my alarm for 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. I'm going to sleep in for the first time in a decade and uh, wake up. And maybe I'll start this book with a cup of coffee. <laughs> and then before I went to bed, I said, screw that. That's not my work ethic. I'm going to set my alarm for 5.30 a.m. I'm going to wake up. I'm going to work out. And I started the book at 6.30 in the morning and wrote till, till 1 a.m. And I did that every day until I had a rough draft done. And now that was about five weeks ago, and it became published and available today. That is crazy. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that that's uh, very common, being able to write a book in, in five weeks, and then also uh, have it available. So it's, um, that's really... Nothing else to do. <laughs> yeah, it helps. Um, I, I think if you want to do something bad enough, and you, you put in the hours and the time, the dedication, and you have a lot of inspiration and help, you, you really can do almost anything. That's awesome. And uh, we have the link in the description if anyone wants to check that out. So I uh, wanted to talk about a couple things that you cover in your book. So uh, one of the things I'd like to know is your typical work day as an agent in Atlanta. So, you know, people understand that a talent agent is submitting them for jobs or helping them get to their audition, but there's so much more to it than that. So what is your regular day like? Just, you know, fighting a war <laughs> all day long. Starts in the seven o'clock hour and it sometimes goes till midnight. Um, you know, what's funny is, so I was an agent in LA first and I thought coming to Atlanta, it would be a cakewalk. And I thought, wow, you know, big deal. I got the Vampire Diaries spinoff, whatever that is right now and Walking Dead. Like what else shoots there? Um, not the case. Atlanta is booming, was booming, and is, was extremely on fire right before the, the pandemic. Um, I work 10 times harder here than I did in LA. The nice thing is I see more success for the hard work here because there's just less competition and an abundance of opportunity. Uh, so what's my day? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I work out first thing. I, I fully believe in being extremely healthy. I think that really helps you achieve more throughout the day. I know people say all the time they don't have time to work out. I disagree. <laughs> Put in 30 to 45 minute workout, you will actually create more energy and more time in your day. And um, eating healthy, 
the nutrients we put in our body strongly affect the makeup and what, what we're able to achieve. I'm not trying to preach or anything. It's just no. Uh, it's a, you're saying that working out is better than drinking five or six cups of coffee to stay awake and be alert. I think so, but I do. <laughs> I do drink a lot of Rockstar um, and coffee um, and tea. Yeah. Um, no, I, I start at seven or so in the morning, usually with the text messages from casting directors and things that came in overnight. You know, because we're three hours behind. And um, I'm on text message while walking the dog and at the gym and going to office. It, it, you know, it starts early and I run a team of people and um, there's three of us. And it shuts down across the country. It, it keeps going. And, you know, if I'm at the gym again in the evening, sometimes I have to leave and go back to the office or if I'm out to dinner, I have to leave and go back. Uh, yeah. it's, it's tough. It's a busy, very busy day. I'm not talking to actors all day long like people think I am. I'm, I'm dealing with problems and talking to casting. That's what I'm doing all day. So one of the questions that we got emailed in a lot um, is, I want to get your attention. Uh, I'm not currently represented by AMT, but I want to grab your attention somehow. What's the best way for someone to get your attention specifically? I love that question. I definitely address that in the book in, in detail. Um, I'll say that timing is a big part of it. Brevity is a big part of getting our attention. Um, perfect example, if I am dealing with an actor who's booked two shows at the same time, and one of them were negotiating his credit and his money and his trailer, and the other one we now have to negotiate these things as well, and one of them is recurring. That is a huge, huge part part of my day. It's you know it's a problem. It's a good problem, but it's a big problem, and that's what my focus is for probably three to four hours. On top of breakdowns flying in, other bookings flying in, avail checks flying in, and new new breakdowns and casting networks throwing us all kinds of stuff that I need to work on to to achieve new you know new work. What I don't have time for at one p.m. on that day in the middle of this storm is to read an email that has four paragraphs and 12 headshots, three links, and a couple of clips to it. I can't just stop my whole life for 15 minutes and give this person I don't know anything about all of my time and attention and put everything else to rest. And you know when else I'm not going to read that 15-minute email? At 1 a.m. on Sunday afternoon. I'm just not. Like, I'm a human, and I want to do other things in the few free moments of the week that I have. So brevity is important. I think getting getting their attention, you have to be extremely concise in what you want and what you've done. Uh, one example that's in the book, uh, because I sometimes help my roster get a manager. Uh, a great example I used recently that worked, I wrote to this manager, just an email. Yo, got an actress that made 50K last year looking for a rep. Want to talk to her? He wrote back in 30 seconds, yup, let's set up a call. Yeah. It moves that fast. Yeah, short and simple. Short and simple. Um, that, so if you're going to you know, attack us through some sort of, of media or, or the internet or the website, keep it short and sweet, and, and it's got to be something that we want to see or hear. Like, I am an Olympic gold contender for horseback riding. I have been on four shows in the past year, whatever it may be. You know, I have 17 headshots with different hair colors. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to deliver you a pizza. What toppings do you want? Whatever. <laughs> don't send this pizza. It, is, um, it has to be short and sweet. The other thing is um, to go back to kind of like what, what our day is like. We're selling all day long. We're not buying. We're literally selling all day long, focused on our current roster. So how are we going to buy you? And that's not something that we're actually doing. It's not a verb that we're doing. Um, but we are at showcases and workshops. You know, so if you're in a class that has a showcase at the end, you've got my full attention. I'm sitting there watching you. So I highly recommend getting in classes and workshops and stuff like that that will have an agent panel at the end. You've got us 100%. And there we might be buying. And the few people that I've brought on our roster in the past three years that are really strong and talented, I got to see their work or work with them, got to know them over an extended period of time, brief as, a, as it may have been, 
And um, that's how they had my attention, and it worked. So if I, um, I guess this could be for talent on your roster or for talent who want to get your attention, should I ask you to grab a drink or a coffee to have a, a meeting? Um, is, is, is that a good idea? Yes, because you know what I would love to do? Nothing more than I would love to work a 10 to 12 hour day and then go sit across from someone for the price of a drink <laughs> and hear all about your life for an extra two hours. No, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, that sounds harsh, but no. Like, my job is not to be your drinking buddy. My job is not to be your best friend. It's not to be your therapist. It's not to be your attorney. It's not to be your publicist. It is to be your talent agent. And what does the talent agent do? They look for and secure opportunities for you to get paid to act and then make sure those payments come through and are accurate. That's my job. And at the end of the day, I want to go home or spend my time with the people that I choose. Nowhere in my job description does it say I need to be going out and celebrating or drinking or partying with all of my clients just because they want to get closer. We don't need to be closer. You just need to have strong materials that I can use to try to get you opportunities. That's it. You know, I know that sounds a, l a little rough. Hey. Not every agent's going to say that or, or, or think that. Um, but I, I'm so burned out, man. I got over 600 some <laughs> clients. And if I went out drinking with everybody all day long, I would have less of a life than the little life I are. And a non-functioning liver. Yeah, I mean, a Atlanta is, is just such a... a a busy market that it makes sense. I think you're just being honest and, and, and how you feel about that situation. So that said, um, there's still ways that someone can get in contact with you. Like you said, if you're not on the roster, send a, a short email or send something, you know, quick, or I, I'm sure you've had this conversation with your existing roster in terms of the best way to get in contact with you or, or like talk to you about things. Um, but absolutely, you know, like you said, after a 10 and 12 hour day that you probably want to just go home. Most yeah. Places, I mean, yeah. and I do hang out with some of my clients. We are, I am human before I am an agent, Yeah, you know, so on a human level, I do have friends that I, that I work with. Um, but that's, that's, yeah, that, that just happens naturally that that can't be forced or created and it shouldn't be. So if I'm not, currently represented and I want to apply to a bunch of different agencies. Um, so there's not just one I'm focusing on there. There's a lot. What would be the best way for me to do that? I would research all of the agencies in your market. Uh, Google is a very, very helpful tool. Um, go on their website, <laughs> spend some, spend some time on their website and see like, what, what are they looking for? Are they, are they looking for, for anyone? How do they operate? Look up people on their roster on IMDb Pro and see, are there people working? Are they working on shows that are currently shooting right here in my market? And, uh, you know, see, do they have a lot of people like you? Does this, does it make sense that I would fit into the, their roster? You know, if you're, let's say you're, you're Asian and you're really tall and you notice they don't have any really, they don't have a single Asian actor over six foot on their roster. Boom. There's your perfect brevity filled email. <laughs> I'm over six foot and Asian and there's no one like me on your roster. I looked, can I submit to you or will you watch my reel and get back to me? You know, um, doing your homework is, is the best way I think to submit an approach. Um, that that's great. And, um, I think so often one thing that talent may or may not know is that you know an agent has their roster with certain types right and you don't want to have too many people of that exact same type um on your roster so having i mean i think it hurts your chances yeah you know if i'm going to submit 22 30 year old brunettes for a role they're not all going to get an audition but if i submit seven and they're all really perfect for it they might right um so you get paid when an actor gets paid um, so when you bring someone on your roster, you have to believe that they are someone who can book. So what are some things that make you say, this is a bookable talent? Another great question. And um, I'll tell you right now, like what I'm looking for is somebody that I, I call it dollar signs. I look at them in dollar signs. I want someone that can book tomorrow, not someone that has potential to book down the road. And how can they book tomorrow? Their toolkit has to be glossy and ready to go. Um, 
toolkit weapons. Let's call them weapons. I use this metaphor in the book too. I say that I'm going to war all day every day for the actor. The actor is giving me weapons to fight with, okay? Weapons are hats, real material, anything that can prove that you're a good actor on video. You know, if you don't have that, how am I supposed to prove that you're good? Just flap in my mouth? That's like saying go to war and fight with your your fists, you know, or like a crappy little knife. Newsflash, you're up against people with grenade launchers and tanks <laughs> and machine guns yeah. for even just small roles. So you have to have expensive looking weapons, powerful weapons. And if you submit to me, to us, to any agent, without any kind of, of uh, a weapon that looks worthy of winning a battle, it's going to be a long, hard, tough, bloody road. And I don't want to travel down that. I don't want to fight that hard for months to a year, never make a buck, or spend a year fighting really hard with my fists and eventually make a hundred dollars. It's just it's it's not worth it. Time versus money. So you gotta you gotta really make sure your ducks are in a row before you submit. And that's what that's what makes you bookable. I think having having an arsenal. And should I decide what my type is ahead of time, or is that something I should work with my agent on? You can. Um, I don't think it works as well as deciding with the people who are going to actually be securing you realistic job opportunities. You know, I moved to L.A. wanting to be the tall, dark, and handsome hero. Um, that's not me. <laughs> one, of the, one of the first things I booked was the geeky <laughs> virgin uh, who saves the world in a sci-fi movie. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I'm still the geeky version, like all American boy. Um, I hope not. <laughs> but yeah. that, that's what the world saw me as, you know? So it's not necessarily what you think you are. A really great way to figure out what your type is, is to ask a, an agent who does this for a living. Um, but also to let your agent try some things and check the patterns that come in through casting requests. If they keep seeing you as a cop over and over and over, and you never thought you looked like a police officer, well, maybe you're moving in that type. Or if they always saw you as a hipster, you know, but you don't think you are, maybe that's your type. Patterns are a great way to kind of tell you what your type is without having to discover it, you know, in search. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting that it, look at what casting is seeing you as. Um, and and that, Yeah, over and over and over again. And, and that might be, um, something you can focus on and um, take advantage of. Um, so one of the things that comes up in every market is I, you know, I'm in this regional market that's not LA and New York, and I want to eventually get to LA and New York. Um, so do you have examples of local talent in Atlanta who have had great success, not based in Los Angeles, that are kind of doing their thing, making a great career out of just being in Atlanta? So many, dude. <laughs> so many. I'm so proud of our roster. I'm so proud of our market. You know, and, and some of my agent friends that are in this market, I'm proud of them too and how hard they work and, and what what this market has even done since, since I've been here has been a huge shift. I've seen a huge a huge change in, in the opportunities that we're given. You know, I rep a lot of series regulars and a lot of recurring guest stars. Um, re I mean, on TV right now, like on Netflix, two of the biggest shows on Netflix have AMT clients. You know, uh, the new season of Ozark, the, the lawyer's daughter, what's the lawyer's name? Helen? Yep. Her daughter, Erin, born and raised in Atlanta, booked it right here in Atlanta, recurring guest star, and she did an amazing job on the show. I'm so so good. Madison Thompson, so proud of her. Yeah. If you're watching Madison, you're probably too busy now with all your Instagram <laughs> fans. Um, she crushed it, and I watched her just grow so, so rapidly over the course of three years with a really strong focus on her craft. She's very intelligent. Um, another actor, Gary Weeks, I mean, he's just crushing it here. He doesn't have an agent or manager in any other market. He's just focused here. He's a really happy husband and father. And uh, he's one of the dads on Outer Banks. And, um, you know, he's a real good-looking, charming dude, and he plays a real asshole on that show. <laughs> and it was a stretch to even get that. And we did it, and we, we fought for it. And um, I Photoshopped the kid and him together and showed casting. Look, they look alike. And he booked yeah. it. And uh, he crushed it. He's so good and so dedicated 
am proud to be an Atlanta actor. And casting is getting better opportunities here, and they're pushing for the actors that they trust and are dedicated. That's great, um, because Atlanta, everyone knows, it's a huge market for production. Um, one of the things I've heard a lot, and people will say, is that, well, there's a lot of production in Atlanta, but you have to be based in Los Angeles to actually book anything um, in Atlanta. So I'm just going to ask you, is that true? No, of course that's not true. I mean, we've got series regulars on, yeah. the, on the roster. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, we have a kid right now who I, I actually drove – this kid, Brandon, if you're watching, dude, I'm so proud of you, drove him to his final callback for a series regular on a new CW pilot. You know, they looked at everybody in L.A. too, but they gave him a shot. And uh, I, I think he was going to book it, and then the show stopped, <laughs> along with many others. So in addition to being an actor, um, you were creating and writing and directing your own projects. One of the things that we've talked about a lot is creating your own content. Do you have any advice for how an actor can create their own content? Uh, major kudos to anyone who's even thinking about doing that. That's the first step. The second step is get something. <coughs> it's impossible to create something that lives in your mind. Get it on paper, whether you have to you know, handwrite it or get it in a, in a computer and then print it out, hold it tangibly. That's the first thing something made. There's a, there's a lot of people that talk, and then there's not a lot of people that there's a lot of people that write, but they don't finish. And then there's a lot of people that finish something, but then they don't film anything. So you got to like take these realistic steps, talk about it, write it down, print it out, organize a crew, film it. Then you have something you can actually show people. Everybody has an idea. You know, I get emails all day long from people that have an idea. I don't get emails all day long from people that have a trailer of their finished film, whether mm -hmm. it's a short or web series or whatever it may be. So I think it's huge for an actor to always be acting. You know, if you're an athlete, you're always training. If you're a writer, you should always be writing. If you're a photographer, you should always be shooting. That's how you get better. If, you're a, if you want to be a chef, you should always be cooking. So as an actor, you shouldn't be waiting for the phone to ring for a chance to be acting. You should always be in class. I think theater is great, mainly because of the discipline behind it. Um, but you can, in today's world, be creating content all the time, even with really good phones. You know, and I taught myself to edit on a YouTube tutorial in like two hours over a decade ago and then just started making stuff. And before you knew it, I had optioned a script and then optioned another one and then was directing one. And it all became, it came from years and lots of hard work and a lot of rejection. And like I learned very quickly how bad I was from so many people telling me. Um, <laughs> but eventually I got something made. You know, yeah. am I proud of that? Not really, but I'm proud that it's finished. <laughs> you know, I'm proud that I did it. And uh, oh, I, I help other people do it probably better than I did. Well, and I think that that's a success on its own is just doing it and, and actually going from the idea or concept to actually finishing that project, which is so hard to do. Um, yeah, man, I think I think some of the greatest stories are told by an actor or written by an actor who has a really strong character with a really strong objective that they want to play. Yeah. Um, so, and, and the other thing too, is that now of any time is the, I wouldn't say the easiest, it's, it's one of the best times to create your own content, not talking about, um, people being quarantined, but just in terms of resources that are available to people, um, to create your own content. So, um, I, I think that's great. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you, and then we'll get into some of the questions that were emailed in. If I receive an audition notice from you and I don't feel like I'm the right fit for this, so I look at the role description and I say, this isn't my age range, this isn't the right look, this is not me, should I talk to you about that and have that discussion with you? Should I just go and do that audition and make the best of it or how should I handle that? That happens way too often. I'm willing to bet there's at least 100 people watching this right now that don't have an agent that would kill for an audition for a major television show or a major movie. And yet we've got clients that love to turn stuff down or tell us that they are the wrong age or the wrong weight or something, you know, the wrong energy. If your agent believes that you were a viable casting option enough to submit you and casting agrees... They think that you're either talented enough or have an interesting enough 
look or an idea about you that you could do it, that is an opportunity to say yes. Saying no gets you nowhere, but saying yes at least opens doors. And even if you don't book this one, your agent's going to like you more and your the casting director is going to like you more. You know, step up to the plate every single time the ball is going to be pitched your way and aim for a home run every single time. Like, that's who I want to rep. Great advice. And, uh, you know, any, anytime you get that um, face-to-face time with a, a casting director, even if it's not for your, you know, the role that you thought that you'd be playing, it, it's it's just <laughs> worth it because they'll – Anytime that a casting director might remember you for something else, it's... it's Absolutely. You know. Who knows they chose to see you for that? Maybe there's a role in the script that's not being released. That happens all the time. And they're like, well, I'm just going to have them read for this. But people will turn it down and not do it at all. And then opportunity missed. And then and then they'll complain two months later, hey, how come that casting director hasn't given me an audition for two months? I wonder why. <laughs> wonder why. Um, so we got a, a ton of questions emailed. Go Miami, Orlando... Uh, and basically every city, um, are you interested in representing actors outside of Atlanta? I guess is how we can sum that up. Um, yes and no. So I'm definitely not interested in an actor who's not working at all in their current market. If you're not constantly working, you know, on, on credible projects, it's going to take a long time. You know, we have to reintroduce you or for the first time, introduce you to all of these brand new casting directors. And I'm brutally honest with them. I'll say this actor doesn't live here. And then they might not want to see you. Let me preface with a problem if you don't live in Atlanta. Schedules change a lot. Fittings happen a lot. Almost every single booking, there's a fitting. And I can't tell you how many times an actor would be booked from L.A., and they'd say, we need you here tomorrow. I can't get there tomorrow. It's $800. Or they, they do. And then they spend $800 and they fly here. And then we find out at 2 a.m. that they didn't wrap and they're not going to be needed. Or they lost the location or it rained. So now they don't need them for two weeks. And now the actor who just spent $800 to fly here in less than 48 hours has no hotel and nowhere to go and nowhere to be. Even though they say they're willing to spend the money and stay. And then they go back and then it moves again. You know, one of my one of my really good friends who I've, I've repped for a long time and took a chance on him, he booked Coming to America too. He flew out here twice and they, they moved his date. You know, it, it's a real pain. And everyone says it's no big deal. I'll do it. I want it so bad. It is a big deal. And um, I can't tell you how many times casting gets pissed when an actor tells the wardrobe person, I can't be there for a fitting in three hours. I live in New York. Yeah, But they were a local hire on their deal memo. And then I get yelled at. And I don't want to yell at the actor for, for lying. Um, so it, it's tough because there are a lot of things beyond our control. We as AMT take, definitely take pride in the fact that like 98, 99% of our roster live within 50 miles of the studio zone. You know, there are a few celebrities that I repped in LA or that I, that I know that I still work with here. And there's a few. But you really... If you want an agent in Atlanta, either we're not the one for you, or you have to be so unique to our roster. You know, I did see a guy at a New York showcase who was probably about 60 years old, bald and really creepy looking and Scottish (laughs) and really, really talented. Uh, I don't know if it was my mom or my dad that said cream always rises to the top. (laughs) Maybe it was somebody else. But this dude was cream. He rose to the top. He was so good. Um, I took a chance on him and his auditions are blowing, blowing me away. He actually lives in LA, but he's willing to go anywhere. He's got the means to do it. Um, so it's, it's kind of rare if, if you don't live here, uh, for me, I, I know that there are other local agencies that, that are a little more lax on that subject. Um, but it's time, it's time versus money. And, you know, I, I take a lot of pride in Atlanta now that I've been here for almost three years. And I love repping the actors that are here, that moved here. You know, I wish I could do a, you know, by a show of hands, everybody at home watching, just by a show of hands, how many of you moved to a different city than the city you grew up in just to get money as an actor, to pursue a career as an actor? Wow, look at that, 1,700 hands. Okay. No, like, Atlanta is a realistic option now, I think, for a, a college student fresh with their degree or, or right out of high school who wants to pursue acting to move here, get in the scene, do their work 
be a grind in the local industry and uh, make money here. Great. Um, second question, is now a good time to submit to agencies or should I wait until things get back to normal, whatever that looks like? You know, there's never a great time or a terrible time. Um, I would say at the a better time is probably around the holidays, like Thanksgiving to December, because we're just generally slower, but at least still kind of working and we're in the office. The thing with right now is like we're not in the office. Um, so you can submit to us, but you're not going to get that human interaction conversing about you behind your back in a good or bad. Way. You know, if you submit to me, it's just coming to me and I'm sitting on the couch watching Game of Thrones. Like it's not I can't I can't really do anything for you right now. So I'm not as motivated to, to help. Um, it doesn't mean that I don't care. It's just that I think a lot of people do get in when we're busy working. So like, you know, we we're working on all these pilots in February and there were so many 18 to play younger roles that if an 18 year old that still looked 15 submitted to us and was like, Hey, I'm 18 to play younger. Here's my reel and headshots. Like that was perfect timing because I could actually utilize them tomorrow. Um, yeah. I can't do anything for you right now. So I'm not as excited right now to look at somebody's materials or to, to work with them. That's part of the reason why I wrote the book. It's more just about kind of get, now's a great time to like get your ducks in a row and focus on your business. Cause as an actor, you're, you're president of your own <laughs> company, you know? So now's a good time to, to focus on the, the business you want to build and get everything ready so that when things come back, which they will, and they're going to come back strong and, and hard and fast. Like, be ready. Next question is, do I have to get SAG credits on my own before finding an agent? Uh, in New York and L.A., you really want to, to be in the union as quickly as possible. I'm very pro-union. I love the union. I hate working on non-union stuff and rarely do because it's a pain in my ass. And it doesn't protect the actor. So can I, sorry, can I say that? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. You say whatever you want. Um, the, the union is a, is a beautiful thing. Uh, in Georgia, it's a right-to-work state. So you don't have to be union. You don't have to have union credits to audition and book union work. Uh, in L.A., New York, in all of the states that aren't right-to-work, it's going to be much harder to even get an audition if you're not in the union. So I would advise getting in as quickly as you can. There's three ways in, you know, you can, you can do background work on three SAG contracts. You can book a principal role or you can, if you're in another union, such as equity, um, the, the stage union, and once you've been in that for like, what is it a year, it's either a year or 18 months. You can then also, um, join just by paying into SAG after. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think it makes sense in, in those markets as quickly as possible in Georgia. You can take a bit you know, a bit longer, take more of your time, but it certainly doesn't hurt your career to join the union. If anything, it adds, you know, an invisible air of respectability amongst your colleagues and, and peers. Great advice. And lastly, any advice on remote auditions? I'm sure people are seeing Zoom or Skype or, you know, any of those type of auditions lately. So any advice for actors on that? That's tough. Um, but we're all in the same boat, you know, we're all human casting directors, producers, agents, actors. That's the one thing we all have in common. We're all human. We are all suffering this pandemic and everybody, everybody just do the best you can. Um, and that said, make sure that it's the best you can though. You know, like right now I don't have any lights. I think I put the camera here where I had a light, just windows hitting me because I wanted it to not look like shit. You know, do, do the best you can with what you have to work with. Um, don't just slap stuff together and say, well, this, you know, coronavirus is going on and I have to turn in this tape. No, get excited about the limited opportunities and do, do the best you can and question every, every technical aspect that you have and every talent craft related choice that you could make and, and really use this time um, to hone your decision making skills as well. Awesome. So we are going to go now into the Q&A section. So we've had a lot of questions for oh, you. Oh, I thought we were done. Uh, you're done. You can leave if you want. We won't answer well, any of these. My, can my dog make a quick cameo? Yeah, yeah bring your dog on. Zach, do you want to come say hi? All right, come here. Okay, everybody, this 
This is Zach Morris. Hi, Zach. Hey, Zach. How you doing, buddy? Yeah, I know. You smell that delicious tea. So, yeah, Zach, Zach is an Australian Yorkie. That's why he's so big. Mm. Zach, say hi. Hi. No, he, uh, <laughs> Zach can answer some of these questions as well. He can't with his walnut-sized brain. <laughs> You're so smart, aren't you, buddy? Yeah. I like Zach. Um, we'll just go into the first question. So, okay. from Lisa... How important is it for a child actor to have a manager? She's been in a movie and a bunch of commercials. Should she get a manager? She already has an agent. You know, it depends what they want. If they feel like she's getting a significant amount of opportunities, Lisa, I'll talk to you. If you feel like you're getting a significant amount of, of opportunities uh, from your agent, you like working with your agent, your agent is uh, getting back to you, uh, answering all of your questions, what more do you need, you know? Um, things that a manager can do that are very beneficial. And this kind of is a broad answer to everyone. You know, they can open your network to their network. So your agent's network is only so, so grand, same as your manager's. But if you bring another person on your team and you're willing to give up another percentage of all of your income to that other person, you get access to their network. And that network might bring you more opportunities, you know, might add more money to the pot. Uh, also, one thing that the managers do that I definitely don't don't do and don't pride myself in and suck at is hand holding. Like I just, I don't have the time in the day to answer a lot of questions, nor do I even want to get them. You know, I get 1400 emails a day and I'd say 1200 of them don't generate any financial business. They're just things that could have been answered by Googling or asking other actors or coaches or maybe even a manager. Uh, managers have less clients usually and more time. So if you want someone to be on the phone with you for a long periods of time, to be helping you with creative decisions about auditions, um, you know, that then a manager might be a good route. But a boutique agent, if it's a boutique agency and they don't have a lot of clients, they might also be able to provide that kind of uh, parental relationship that some agents or parents require. Because there's a lot of there's a lot of information and knowledge to be learned in this industry. Uh, it's very overwhelming, and I I know I, I do get a lot of questions from parents, and my heart goes out to them for having their own career and so badly wanting to give their child everything. I love it. I love, I love some of the parents of my kids and uh, they work so hard. Uh, the ones that have managers, it's great though. If they can ask managers questions instead of me. <laughs> great advice. I'm going to see if I can make these a little smaller. These are, I'm, I'm throwing these up on the screen. They're so big. Um, so the question is, and this is good because AMT has so many different divisions. Um, do you only accept talent across board? In the Southeast, that's pretty standard. You know, when I was in LA, we had a theatrical, we had theatrical agents and commercial agents, and we do still have all those agents, but it was not across the board. So I repped a lot of people for film and TV only in LA while they were with another agency commercially. Now here, if you're, if you're with AMT or, or People Store or Houghton or Purvis or, you know, one of the other agencies in, in Atlanta, you're probably with them commercially, voiceover, <laughs> industrial, print, film and TV. Yeah, the whole shebang. Great. Uh, Tally Joe asked, would you consider someone in Alabama to be close enough to be considered Atlanta local? I would. Yeah, they have a much better shot. Uh, I rep a little girl from Atlanta that, um, yeah, she was on the last season of House of Cards. Played the young, uh, what's her name? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's hard to remember all the the character names for every for yeah. every show. She was also the young Ruth on Ozark, and that whole scene got cut. Um, yeah, I love her, Ann Charles. If you're if you and your family are watching, um, yeah. I mean, we you know we rep some people that live in other cities in and in Georgia and in Tennessee and Florida and in Carolinas and the neighboring areas. It's not as easy um, as them actually being here and being this real local community. Um, but that's much more possible than having to fly in. Awesome. Um, Again, though, they, you, you got to be unique to what we have, or it's a waste of everyone's time. Jerry wants to know, why is it so important to have a live reader in a taped audition? Well, Jerry, <laughs> I think that the auditions, and believe me, I watch a lot of them, uh, are about the reader, not about the actor. I think when it's all about the actor, it oddly looks like an audition 
and it looks selfish, which is the best way I can say it. And I think the most successful actors, even maybe the most successful people I know, are so selfless. Like, they're so giving. Part of the reason I hated acting, writing, directing, I felt like it was always like, look at me, look at me. And I was miserable. Um, as soon as I decided I was going to use my limited skill set to help others, <laughs> like I started getting rewarded in life with things that I always wanted. And I wasn't doing anything for me all day long. I was literally spending every ounce of energy helping other people. And you as an actor can do that on an audition with the reader. And even if the reader sucks, try to get a response out of them. Then we're going to watch you try to do something, try to get a response out of them. Remove all the energy from you, put it on them, put the energy outside of you as the actor. So that so much so that we wish that the camera would turn around and we could see the reader's response. That's why you gotta, you gotta have a real reader. You, you, you're a human being. If not, it looks like an audition. And auditions don't book, stories book. You know, when it looks like a story and the easiest way to get to a story is by losing that energy and giving it away. Then we're watching it. Yeah. And uh, you want to eliminate distractions as much as possible um, and, and have whoever's watching it just focus on, on your performance. Um, Reginald said, I'm an actor in the regional market of South Florida. I need to get my reel together. What material can I put together for a reel if I don't have one now? So, you know, I would say probably if you don't have credits, what can I put together in a reel? You know, there's, there's a lot of debate about creating your own reel <laughs> or, you know, holding out for good material. I'm a fan of creating your own material as long as it shows that you're a good actor. If you put something together with friends or a company and it shows some kind of quality, it's well lit, good audio, there's depth to make you look important, and the acting is strong, that's only going to move you forward in this business. If you have nothing, it's very hard to move you forward. So find a way to create your own stuff. I mean, I, I had a, an actress that was very talented with her MFA in acting and no, no credits. And she put some stuff together um, for little to no money, and it, it looked pretty good. And she was booked in a role opposite Laura Dern within six weeks of handing me that reel. Um, and now she's recurring on Homeland, and she's on nine episodes of a new Tyler Perry show. I mean, like, it started her career. She's on two episodes of The Outsider, all off of a reel that she made. That's great. So. Olivia asked, going back to something you said earlier, how do actors get their weapons if they are new to the business and don't have any experience on film? Great question. Um, you know, what? The, probably the first weapon you need is craft. So get in a class and, and, and work on that craft because other people are going to have that weapon. They're going to they're gonna be a good actor. So, you know, you're, you're doubt, it's doubtful that you're just born ready to make money as an actor. You know, there are people that, that watch somebody play piano and... Let's, let's use piano. How many people, like, imagine will watch a piano player who's getting paid to play somewhere and say, oh, that looks cool, I want to do that, and then start making money playing piano a week later? Like, no, you don't. <laughs> right. You have to learn how. You have to learn how to be an actor. You have to learn how to navigate through the entertainment industry. You have to learn these steps, and that's going to take time. Um, so, yeah, get in a class. Read some books. Those would be your first materials. Get knowledge. I always say I like to work with powerful people. How do you become powerful? Knowledge. Knowledge is power. Read a lot. Study a lot. You know, educate yourself. And then, you, you know, other other weapons that are easy to get, like headshots. You can get headshots. Get them, get them right away. And look up photographers in your market that have actors on their website that are working actors that faces you recognize. And if you don't recognize any, just make sure that, that the quality looks expensive. You know, I say this all the time too, like billion dollar industry, a billion dollar industry. You think you can just throw some crap together and, and make it look like you fit in? Like, no, <laughs> like even scale pay per day is a thousand and five dollars, which is about 125 bucks an hour. If you want to make $125 an hour, 
you need to be educated and ready for it and look worth it. Oops. Amazing advice. Um, one question. I don't know if it's amazing advice, but uh, also keep in mind, I'm just one dude. Everything I say is not right. Like, I'm just, I'm throwing out my opinion. It's your, your opinion. I, I think it's yeah. great. Um, it's I, not the I, be all end all of, of what's right and wrong in the entertainment industry. I did have one uh, question on here that someone asked if you are planning on doing an ebook or an audio book or anything. Yes, both. Um, the ebook, if it's not available already, uh, for pre-order, the ebook will be available within the next two weeks on the same link. And uh, my buddy, who's a composer in Nashville, is helping me with the audiobook. Matthew, if you're watching, uh, taking you up on that offer. <laughs> so there will be an audiobook available. Um, that's probably going to be within the next like three months, though. Awesome. Uh, Ashley wants to know your most fulfilling moment you've had as an agent. Really? <laughs> you know, there's a lot of them. There really are. I love. I love, love my job and so many of my clients. I love my boss, as crazy as she is. I don't know if you're watching, Sarah, but, you know, she's she's a good human at, at her core. She is. Um, you know, I mentioned it uh, earlier for Gary. I don't, I don't I doubt you're watching, Gary, but this was a great moment because uh, this is a, a great example of thinking outside the box and working overtime. And I think that this can be paralleled to anyone in any industry. So if I were to use one of my moments to actually help people listening to that right now, this would be it. Um, it was a Sunday afternoon and the casting director texts me, Hey, this role that we are shooting, it does only have one line, but it, we just found out that it's going to recur. And now I've been given, you know, six pages of dialogue from a future episode. Can you, have all of the people that you had taped for it, retape and get it to me today. And I was Sunday and I was at brunch with friends and I dropped everything I was doing to, to reach out. And then I thought, you know what, like, uh, the, this actor, Gary Weeks is one of you know, I'd say we're very close on a personal level as well. And I thought he was right for the role, but I didn't submit him because he mostly does only recurring guest stars. And this was one line, but now that it was recurring and I read the size, I thought it's pretty meaty. Uh, he's very wrong for the role though. So uh, I, I submitted him any, anyways to the casting director. I said, you know, like, if I can get Gary to tape for this last minute on a Sunday, can he? And the casting director said, oh, honey, no, I've known Gary a long time. He's not right for this role. And I just took that as a great opportunity to, to do it anyways. So I said, hey, man, you want to do this? I know it's Sunday afternoon. You want to throw this together? Like, I know that you usually play, like, the charming, good-looking, suave guy. And this is the, you know, excuse my language, white, trash, drunk, asshole, father who beats people. Do um, you want to do it? And he was like, yeah, yeah, let me throw something together. So he, he dropped everything he was doing on a Sunday afternoon and got me that audition in about two hours. I watched it and started bragging to a bunch of my friends, like, you got to see this. Look how good this is. This is, this is so effing good. <laughs> and uh, I sent it to the casting director. And then, yeah, I immediately started, like, everything about the show how could I get him this role and I photoshopped the picture of him next to the kid when I found out oh this is the father of one of the series regulars and and I I, I put to, I like re-edited some of his reels and like just put this huge package together in a pitch and sent her everything and then didn't hear anything and she called the office about 11 a.m the next day laughing and she said Jason I will never distrust your your opinion again he's booking the role and in less than 24 hours, he was on the road to Charleston for this role that became overscaled, demanded a triple banger, a recurring guest star, and he ended up in a ton of episodes. And the show just launched, Outer Banks. It just launched on, on Netflix, and it's doing really well, and I'm really proud of him. And it all stems down to, like, I could have sat at brunch and just been like, I'm not dealing with this. Yeah. You know? Or I could have just forwarded it to someone else. Like, I, I could have said no so many ways. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I love what I do, and I and I think thinking outside the box is really important, and and seizing opportunities when they're in front of you are really important. A lot of people are lazy, and lazy is not going to get you anywhere. You know. Yeah, I, I think that that's got to be the most rewarding thing as an agent is just seeing talent on your roster book something, and and that excitement that they get, and being able to share in that with them. It's just got to be such a rush. Well, I know, and he's a great dad. He's got two kids, and I love knowing that. Like, I know how much he made, and I know that that's putting food on his kids' table. You know, like it's yeah. just awesome what we're doing. It's awesome. 
Jason uh, wants to know, are local hires in Atlanta still cast through the LACD or are day player roles cast in Atlanta? What's up, Jay? Um, <laughs> I mean, if it's cast through an LA casting director, it's, it's LA for the most. Um, but like this regular I'm dealing with on the CW right now, you know, I was talking to Sandy Logan and Tara Feldstein about it. Uh, so they kind of work together sometimes. It, it, it totally depends. Every show and every role is, is going to be different. Um, very few day player roles that shoot in the Southeast are cast by the, the LA casting director. You know, the, the, there are a few casting directors in Atlanta that are very powerful right now and really good at what they do. Yep. I mean, I don't know if you're watching George, but like George Pierre, like he knows what he's talking about. He, he, <laughs> he knows his craft. He's really good. And if he says no to a pitch, like, which is rare, it's because he really has a vision, and I yeah. respect that. And George is also one of the nicest people I've ever come across in my life. So, Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. He's, he's awesome. We have time for, I think, one more question. And there are so many good ones, so I feel so bad that we can't take every single question. Uh, but they're but all in the book. They're all in the book, so the book you can has ninety-eight questions answered. So you can definitely take a look at that and um, get your questions answered there. Let's see. Do you love this awkward silence while I read all these questions? I'm just like, mm. all right, Danielle, you're you're getting it. So we're gonna we're gonna throw this on here. <laughs> Cream rising to the top. What makes a person stand out to you other than appearance? Obviously resume. Obviously real. I love when the reel opens and it moves real fast and it's like 90 seconds and it's just loaded with close-ups of you talking. Opposite A-list stars are on, you know, top network shows. Um, so resume, resume and reel. And special skills, you know. If you can speak three languages, I... Now is a wonderful time to not be Caucasian. Man, like <laughs> People ask that question all the time. Surprised we didn't get that question. Yes, it's a really great time for opportunities right now um, for all non-Caucasian actors. Open ethnicity roles are, are uh, you know, flying in abundance, and I love that. Uh, and, and so I guess that's kind of appearance. But speaking other languages and, and special skills like certifications and whatnot, and, you know, sign language and horseback riding and weapons training or being able to do stunts, you know, hula hoop champion, whatever, whatever you may be, these things stand out um, and make you unique. And if you're unique in the world, you're unique on the roster and uh, your opportunities go up and your competition goes down. Great answer. And with that, we are out of time. Uh, so thank you, Jason, so much uh, for chatting with us today. Thank you, everybody, for uh, your questions. Uh, definitely check out the book. You can follow Jason on Instagram. Um, anything else that you wanted to mention before we sign off? No, that's, I mean, thank, thank you, Tommy. Thank you, Casting Networks, for giving me my start 11 years ago. <laughs> and and um, thanks to everybody watching. You didn't have to, to give up an hour of your life to be here with us, but you did, and that's one step that shows how serious you are about your career. And um, to touch on the one thing I said earlier, like, gaining knowledge whether or not anything i said today was correct or accurate hopefully you learned something and um and are more knowledgeable and more powerful than you were you know an hour and 10 minutes ago great um thank you everybody thanks jason and we will see you all next time thanks thanks